to offer a special welcome to some of our elected officials, Ken Reeves, former mayor, who's here. A lot of um, people couldn't join us tonight because kind of there's a lot going on in the city, you may have heard. Um, but we are happy to be having this series filmed, so you'll be able to see that. So, how many people in the audience are Cambridge Historical Society members? Yes, nice, thank you. Wow, what a great showing. Um, so, for those of you who didn't raise your hands, great news, you can sign up today. Um, just outside, any of us would be happy to sign you up. Um, you can also uh, we accept credit cards, check, or online at CambridgeHistory.org. We are a private nonprofit, which means we don't rely on any city, state, or federal funding for our operations. We rely on the generosity of Cambridgeians like you to do programs like these. We also preserve our headquarters, the Hooper Lee Nichols House on Umbrella Street, the second oldest building in Cambridge. How many people have been? Excellent, we're having a house soon, so please come if you haven't been in a while. We also have historical research collections. Thank you for your support and confidence in all of our work. If you find value in the kind of work that we're doing, um, I know a lot of you have said when you were coming in, you were surprised an organization like ours is doing this. If that's something that's important to you, I hope you'll consider supporting us. Um, we definitely cannot do this work without your help. What we do literally could not happen with the incredible support of our volunteers. So if you are interested in our programs and events and you want to serve on a committee or volunteer your time in our office, we would be very grateful. I have to say, we have the best snacks. And we're very nice to work with, so um, you, you wouldn't be wasting your time. So in addition to the generous support of our members, I would like to thank our sponsors for our Housing for All series. Alexander Real Estate Equities, Bull French Properties, Capital One Cafe, right here tonight, HYM Investment Group, Eastern Bank, Harvard Square Business Association, Graffito SP, Leader Bank, North Cambridge Cooperative Bank, and Whole Foods. So thank you for your generous sponsors. I also want to extend a very, very special thanks to our lead sponsors, Cambridge Savings Bank and the Mass Foundation for the Humanities. Cambridge Savings Bank has been a great supporter of the society since we were founded. So thank you so much to Cambridge Savings Bank. The Mass Foundation for the Humanities. If you don't know about this organization and you like the idea of an event like ours, you will love the work of the Mass Foundation for the Humanities. Please go to their website and see what they're up to. So why is the Cambridge Historical Society holding an event about housing? The Society recently made a very important decision. Because we believe that the history of our city is relevant to our lives today, Going forward, we will focus on issues that we as a city are facing and offer the historical perspective. We intend to help you understand how we got here so we can all think about solutions, so we can problem solve better and smarter. We intend to use history as a guidebook. The stories, motivations, interests, and decisions of those who came before us need to be told, explained, and discussed. That said, we don't see ourselves as hosting a current issues forum. Instead, our goal is to slow down these issues and use history to examine them. We are asking each other, how did we get here? What happened and why? What's my role, my responsibility in solving this problem? That's the work of history, the work of our historical society. And there are three tools that we use. One, humanities. We are approaching this issue that is on the minds of everyone in Cambridge through humanities lens, specifically a historical one. This is different from how other groups approach these topics where they use data. We use stories. Perspective. Through our expert panelists, we are proving, we are providing you with background so you have more information to inform your conclusions. We hope that this background augments what you already know. We hope some information will surprise you. We are looking for raised eyebrows, nudges to the friend next to you, and audible wows. <laughs> There's a lot we don't know, a lot we take for granted, and a lot that we forget. And the third is empathy. As you have no doubt already heard me say, history is everything. History is not just the pursuit of armchair history buffs or memorizing battle dates. It's not static facts. It's the web of stories that define us as human beings. It is the remembering and reflecting on the events of the past so we become more empathetic people, so we are humbled, so we are better citizens. So together we make a better city, a better world.
That's the work of historians, amateur professional, and that's what we are hoping to do tonight. There's so much to cover on this topic. We have three events, as you know, but we could have had a dozen. Um, so thank you for keeping this in mind as we have to rush through hundreds of years of Cambridge history. Um, I do want to review that we have some three ground rules for tonight. They can also be found in the conversation guide that you received. One, active listening. Pause and repeat back in your head what you heard before speaking or raising your hand. Don't just hear, absorb all you've observed. Two, ask questions based on genuine curiosity. And three, speak and think with empathy. Be a historian that is understand the life circumstances swirling around a person is what led them to a decision. Think about these conditions before passing judgment. I do have some housekeeping to take care of. Tonight's event features short talks with three great speakers, followed by a discussion moderated by Representative Decker. We will then open up the conversation to you through microphone, just there in the corner. So if you have a question, we hope you'll walk up and ask and meet your turn. Um, we also have note cards in the back near Lynn. And um, if you don't want to come to the microphone, you can write down your question and pass it up, and our panelists will answer it. Keep in mind that what we discuss tonight will not be forgotten. We're being recorded by our friends at CCTV. Um, it's going to air in a couple weeks. Um, but we're also taking notes and writing everything down for two purposes. One is to pass up to the city to inform the master plan and vision Cambridge. And two, what we talk about tonight is, will be recorded in the historical record. So what we talk about will be um, written down, will be put in our archives, and then a hundred years from now, everyone will know what we as Cambridge were facing and thinking and feeling about this issue. Don't you wish that existed for 1916? That's the work that we're doing. Um, if you are on Twitter, we are at CambridgeHS, and the hashtag is Housing for All, so please participate. You can also join the conversation on Facebook or Instagram. The speakers from all the conversations have sent us suggestions for reading, and those are in your handout. Also, our friends from the Cambridge Public Library have some um, books that they've laid out on the tables that um, they want you to think about as you read as well. There are three great repositories here in Cambridge with historical collections. And one is our Historical Society. Two is um, at the Cambridge Historical Commission, Emily Gonzalez will help you with anything you want to know there about the history of buildings in the city. Also, you can corner Charlie after the talk. And Alyssa Pacey here, who's the archivist for the library, has a beautiful exhibit up on her room, the Cambridge Room. Has anyone been up there? Beautiful space. I hope you go check it out. Um, she, all three archivists in the city are so kind and so willing to help you answer any of these questions about housing. Finally, there is a survey in your guide. Please fill it out. We listen to everything that you say. Um, it's really important for us to know what you think. Um, for our own purposes, but also it helps me ask for money. So please go ahead. Um, silencing your cell phones would be wonderful. That is a thing that you can do. Thank you. I'm so pleased and honored to share the stage today with such great Cambridge experts. I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Representative Marjorie Decker. Marjorie Decker was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives in 2012 representing the 25th Middlesex District, which includes parts of the Cambridge neighborhoods of West, North, Riverside, Cambridge Ward, and Mint Cambridge. She currently serves as Vice Chair of the House Committee on Global Warming and Climate Change, as a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, and as a member of the Joint Committees on Healthcare, Financing, and Housing. Marjorie is also a former 14-year veteran of the Cambridge City Council, where she was a strong voice for social justice in the local community. For her final three terms, she chaired the Council's Finance and, Fud Finance and Budget Committee, the first woman to ever do so, and has also led its public health and housing committees. She was one of only 13 women to be elected to City Council in more than 150 years, and served a term as Vice Mayor of Cambridge. Marjorie's deep roots in the community have grown up in public housing in Cambridge, a stone's throw from where she and her family now reside. She was the first in her family to graduate from high school at Cambridge Ridge in Latin, she then went on to graduate with honors at UMass Amherst and earned her master's at, at, at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government in 2007. Prior to her work in Cambridge, Marjorie taught first grade as a special education teacher to Teach for America in Louisiana. Outside of state and local government, she has a life. Um, she enjoys spending time with her husband and her two children. Um, please join me in welcoming tonight's moderator, Professor Decker.
interest, and so they gave us Harvard College as a consolation prize in <laughs> '36. So the originally, uh, in, and for the first almost century and a half, there was only one village in what's now uh, Cambridge. Cambridge extended at one time from uh, uh, Newton on the south to almost to the Merrimack River on the north. By 1807, it was reduced to its current boundaries. The one village was the village at Harvard Square, which is shown in a French uh, uh, map here as having 80 houses and one university. The houses were something like this. Um, this was a, uh, a 1725 house, but not much different from the houses that were built in the first period in, in the village. Uh, this house lasted on JFK Street until 1900. You can get a sense of just how small and perhaps how mean uh, some of the accommodations were for working people in the village at that time. Uh, prosperous farmers occupied houses like this, uh, now on Elmwood Avenue, but built on Russell Street in North Cambridge in 1757 and moved to Elmwood Avenue in 1960. Beginning in about 1750, uh, the farmland and pasture land that was, uh, had been occupied by the Puritans and their descendants for 130 years began to be bought up by West Indian planters who were finding the climate in Jamaica and Barbados uh, unhealthy and looked to, to um, uh, develop summer and then year-round residence in New England, uh, in, in uh, Rhode Island, on the Charles River, on the Mystic River. Uh, but here, uh, this map shows the, the, the amount of Cambridge territory that was acquired by these uh, upper class loyalist uh, uh, Tories who depended on their plantations in the West Indies for uh, their economic existence. Uh, the significance of this map is that these areas were among the best land in Cambridge, and as they were sold or confiscated and then purchased by the American uh, revolutionaries, uh, they were fairly well curated and then subdivided in the suburban period in the 19th century. Uh, areas outside of this, these estates were more randomly divided um, uh, at various times. So the upper class, of course, lived in houses like, like this, um, John Basil House, that's now owned by the National Park Service, or Marika's House at uh, the Cooper Lee Nichols House at the Cambridge Historical Society. Uh, all of these were owned by, by the loyalists. The, the geography changed in 1793 when the first bridge was built direct to Boston. Um, in 1793, there were only three farms between Harvard Yard uh, and all of East Cambridge and Cambridgeport. Uh, it was just a very, um, it was worn on pasture, marshland, uh, very little bit of agriculture, uh, not prosperous at all. But there was this enormous desire line that was satisfied with the construction of the West Boston Bridge uh, between Boston, which is seen here with the State House on, on the right, uh, on top of Beacon Hill, and um, Western Massachusetts, Southern New Hampshire, Southern Vermont. So within a um, uh, little over 30 years, at the time of this map, there are two bridges now, and all of the streets east of of Harvard University are laid out to connect to those bridges or to provide uh, suburban accommodations uh, for uh, 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 or, or living accommodations for people who are settling in two brand new villages, East Cambridge and Cambridge Port. All of these streets are laid out as turnpikes or as part of real estate speculations. Hampshire Street, so called because it went to New Hampshire. Uh, Broadway was the extension of the Concord Turnpike. Western Avenue went west, all the way west, uh, River Street, and so on. Uh, these are uh, major long distance routes that all cross the formerly empty farmland of Cambridge, converge at Kendall Square or at Leishman Square, and then go into Boston. So these became the first mass transit routes uh, in, um, in the Northeast, the first horsepower line. Um, outside of New Orleans was built between downtown Boston over today's Longfellow Bridge through Central Square and Harvard Square to Malarum Cemetery in 1853. That was soon followed by these other routes that are marked in red on this, this map. 
The uh, bridges were toll bridges until 1854. Uh, when the tolls were lifted, then uh, <coughs> Cambridge became more of a, of a possibility for uh, people moving out of the North End and Boston, other Boston neighborhoods and looking for a suburban existence. So the three villages had very different character and very different housing structure as a result. East Cambridge, which is seen here, uh, looking from the State House uh, past um, the Charles Street Jail with East Cambridge in the far distance, was an industrial, a planned village um, with industrial roots. Uh, it was also the site of the Middlesex County Courthouse from um, 1830. <coughs> the main rationale was industry, the New England glassworks at first, and then other industries that followed. The housing, such as these, this view on Winter Street, East Cambridge, was workers' cottage or workers' cottages built for built for glass workers, um, often uh, containing uh, several families um, and borders. Housing conditions in industrial East Cambridge were um, extremely poor. You can just imagine living on uh, Monroe Street at the corner of Third, uh, next to this uh, gas holder. Uh, this is now the uh, site of I think it's the Watermark Apartments on Third Street and Kendall Square. Uh, things have changed uh, a little bit in this neighborhood. Uh, Cambridge Port grew up around Lafayette Square. Uh, the, uh, the meeting house here was at the intersection of Main Street, which is going off in the center, and Mass Avenue was in the foreground. This was where all of those tradesmen and farmers from northern and western New England would come and spend the night uh, before going to the market in Boston uh, the next morning. Uh, it became a suburb. Uh, a suburb that was written up in the New England agriculturalist as being a, uh, a clean and fresh and salubrious place to live. Uh, this Greek revival cottage, we think, was on, it was identified as being a Cambridge port, and we think it was on Cottage Street. Uh, Cambridge port um, was like a, a western town, um, practically, you know, spr springing up practically overnight um, on virgin ground uh, with no you know, real uh, planning, there well, some basic planning in the street layout, uh, no real economic generator like East Cambridge had the industries in the courthouse. Cambridge Port develops as a suburb uh, for people from northern New England, uh, from farming, uh, farmers, farming communities are coming here. You know, a generation later, they're going to Ohio or to uh, western New York or to Illinois. In, in this period, they're coming to Cambridge Port and making their fortune. Um, middle class housing is, is uh, prevalent in this part of Cambridge Port, and so is multifamily housing as density increases um, as the uh, transit links to Boston uh, get, uh, get closer. The area of East Ca Eastern Cambridge Port that we call the Port, or more recent, or recently Area 4, is, uh, became by the 1870s the densest part of Cambridge and uh, the part that was um, of Cambridge Port that was oldest began to have the most deteriorated housing, uh, began to have some social issues, but it was also an area where industry was, uh, was settling along the, the river. Um, uh, wars were serving river traffic. The railroad came through in the 1850s, uh, was a nuclear uh, catalyst for industrial development. And so, in a very small area, you had a range of housing um, and social conditions. This is Broadway looking west at Columbia Street. The building on the left uh, still exists, although it no longer has its uh, conical uh, top. On the right, um, that's now Linwood uh, Court, where that Greek Revival house is, with two houses. It's now a, a corner uh, filled with three deckers from the 19-teens. But just to the south of that, uh, Clark Street barely exists today, but it ran north and south between Broadway and Main Street in that area of the, of the lower port uh, that had the earliest settlement and the densest settlement. Uh, this photograph taken by the city engineer in 1901 uh, shows the range of working class housing here, um, uh, the brick two family from 1855, uh, the single family from um, 1868, and the range of um, diverse racial and ethnic and economic groups that were settling in this area. 
There were new three deckers there um, in 1901. Um, absentee landlords were building houses like this to rent. Um, but the area was, by the um, early 20th century, was considered to be a problem for the city. Uh, I think partly because diversity was considered a problem. It was Cambridge's leading minority neighborhood. Uh, partly because of industrial uh, industries nearby. Uh, uh, partly because this developed in the era before zoning was adopted in 1924. So you can see, you may be able to see here, the mixture of uses uh, that are represented in the Cambridge Rubber Company right at the bottom of the slide, um, uh, mixed in with residential development. This kind of indiscriminate mixture of uses was considered um, really unhealthy. It was, in fact, uh, you know, unhealthy for nearby residents. So in the 1930s, uh, the city was the first to take advantage of the new federally funded housing programs that were part of the New Deal. Uh, they were intended to replace slum conditions with uh, modern housing on the European model. Uh, this is Newtown Court as, uh, as completed. Uh, that's in the area that is shown on the previous slide. Uh, Washington Street at the top, Main Street at the bottom, and uh, Columbia Street on, on the left. Uh, this is, uh, and, and at the top of the slide is the area that's now uh, occupied by uh, Washington Elms. And you get a sense of the enormous contrast in design um, and social engineering, the thought that went into providing uh, this housing. On um, move in day in January 1938, um, something like 230 uh, white families moved in. Uh, one black family moved in. Uh, these were families that were uh, carefully selected by the Cambridge Housing Authority uh, to, uh, for the privilege of living in this modern housing. The uh, city's housing efforts in this period went ahead with more and more uh, public housing. Newtown Court uh, opened in 1942. Uh, with another 324 units. Then after the war, Jefferson Park in 1949, uh, Roosevelt Towers in 1952, uh, Representative Decker will re recognize this, with 228 units and a mixture of medium rise and high rise buildings. Uh, and then, and so in 1950, the Housing Authority uh, could claim one of the most productive records of any housing authority in the country with 10 projects completed containing 1,700 units um, in 15 years. After that, things went downhill fast. Um, the, the social engineering that is um, present, in, you know, the development of denser and denser public housing units uh, uh, transformed it into uh, private housing uh, investors developing projects like this under the zoning that was adopted, adopted in 1962. Uh, there could have been a fourth tower on the same parcel of land. Uh, it still would have been a bright without any zoning uh, uh, permission required at all. Uh, 500 units of wrench towers. So the, the demogra demographic end of the question, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this graph shows you the, the trend of Cambridge population growing exponentially in the late 19th century, uh, peaking in 1930 at 113,000, excluding students and people in dormitories, and then dropping by almost 30% to a little over 80,000 by 1990, and now rising again. Uh, between 1990 and 2000, rent control is abolished. Uh, that's not reflected so much in the demographics, but as it is in the social and economic composition of the housing, of uh, renters and owners, and of course in the housing, housing market. The city um, in the post-war period was desperate for development with that drop in population that uh, an eroding tax base or industries were leaving. City took advantage of urban renewal authority to demolish the Rogers block, which stood on Main Street, and, uh, and eventually all the factories around Temple Square. As uh, by the Cambridge Redevelopment Authority, this was a, an occasion for public celebration in 1957 when the bulldozers arrived at the Rogers block and the rich um, van turned up to, um, uh, to celebrate. We got Tech Square as a result, uh, which is 
the catalyst, yes, I got that. Five mm -hmm. minutes, I'm, I'm here, five minutes or less. Um, Tech Square is the catalyst for the, the incredible uh, high-tech, uh, biotech economic revolution that followed um, after several more decades of not much activity uh, than an explosion that has fed uh, demands on the housing market. But in the 1950s, it was this question of rehab or demolish. These are houses on Putnam Avenue being demolished for Putnam Gardens. Uh, the city um, formed a committee on home hygiene in 1952 to examine conditions in lower Cambridge Board near Fort Washington, found uh, that housing conditions were uh, really adversely affected by the um, junkyards and scrapyards and trucking terminals that uh, populated that part of the city and enumerated um, the deficiencies, the shared baths, the lack of baths um, uh, in, the, um, in the neighborhood, in the namely three-decker neighborhood. Three-deckers were always an issue. Uh, they be appeared beginning in about the 1890s with flat roof technology. Uh, they were economically efficient. Uh, they were uh, considered to be uh, harbingers of social change by the established neighborhoods in Cambridge. The city uh, went back and forth on banning them. The legislature allowed uh, communities to ban tenements, meaning three-deckers, um, in the early 20th century. Uh, Arlington or Belmont, towns like that, uh, banned them early. Cambridge banned them for a while around the First World War, permitted them again. Uh, the problems were that they were clumsily built uh, before zoning. They could be as close as three feet apart as these two on, on Howard Street. Uh, they were considered to be beyond the economic means of the owners to maintain, and, um, and on and on. Uh, but in the 1920s, they were the housing um, uh, uh, solution of choice. Uh, three decades and two family houses see proliferating on Chilton Standish and Lakeview Avenues in this era of view from 1929. Uh, the three deckers I looked up on Standish, uh, none of them were assessed today for less than a million, uh, a couple of them up to a million two. Uh, the two families almost as, almost as much, and the one single family that's here somewhere is assessed for over two million. Uh, an astonishing uh, development in the last couple of decades. So, Quickly, what's Cambridge been doing? The City for Affordable Housing, the Community Preservation Act, adopted in 2002, um, has allowed us to invest $130 million uh, in producing or protecting expired and used units or producing new affordable housing units. Uh, Six million of that comes from historic preservation grants through the Cambridge Historical Commission. The Jefferson Park Rehab, uh, hopefully working with individual owner occupants, working with investors on uh, renovating roads, all of these are affordable housing projects, conversion of the Immaculate Conception Church, uh, conversion of the Chapman Arms in Harvard Square. Uh, these are all uh, projects that you would not ordinarily walk down the street and identify as being affordable housing. Uh, they are. Uh, we put great efforts into making sure that affordable housing in Cambridge looks as good as or better uh, than the housing the rest of us live in. So that's um, a very quick overview. I'm sorry if I've taken too long, uh, but there we go. Thank, Thank you. you.
successful administrative infrastructures, including a best practices model to attract, recruit, and retain diverse staff. Karin attended Mount Holyoke College as a single parent and graduated cum laude in 2007 with a degree in economics. Educated by a humble background where she witnessed people who worked very hard every day but yet were still unable to feed or house their families. She became involved and interested in applying for academic training toward income inequality and poverty policy in the U.S. She founded Good Bank, a micro-lending project which for two years has served people experiencing homelessness <coughs> in Cambridge. She continues to advocate for pro-poor economic policies. The project that brings her in the most joy is her child, a member of the Game of Rimpen Latin, class of 2017. And I want to say personally, thank you. You really were a shining light for the community center, which is probably one of our oldest community health programs in the city, serving an incredible population of young people. So thank you for stepping up and stepping in. Borrow more or look for more jobs. This is 
is all relevant as you think about housing. But still a little experiment. I'll ask everybody to close your eyes <laughs> so that you don't worry about what others think about you. So if people have their eyes closed, I want homeowners to take a minute to think about how you ended up with your first home. Raise your hand if you inherited a house. Raise your hand if you got a down payment as a gift when you got married. Or raise your hand if you took a loan, maybe from your parents or grandparents, to get that down payment. Or if you had a free place to live while you scrimped and saved up money to get that down payment. Maybe you stayed with parents or relatives. All right, um, people can open their eyes now. I just want you to keep in mind, though, what helped you get your first home. And think about others who were like me. If you looked at my assets, when during my life could I have ever accumulated money for down payment? Remember, I come from a poor family, so no one could lend me $50,000 or $10,000. No one in my family happens to live in the area and have an extra guest bedroom, so I was on my own. Since age 17, when I first started living alone, because I didn't have any money for down payment for a home, my only choice was to rent. Since age 17, I have paid over $300,000 in rent. I have nothing to show for it. It's lost money. Don't get me wrong, I'm keenly aware of the privilege of having a roof over my head, of being warm in the cold winter, of keeping my child housed in a safe and dangerous world. But for all those years of work, all those hours of work, I had zero dollars in assets all those paychecks, all those hours away from my baby, nothing to show. I'm going to take a second to remind you that this is one of the parts where it's my story, but it's the story of so many others. All right, so now we're talking about housing, and we're asking questions about what home means to us. When I moved to Massachusetts in 2003, I put my name on a list for affordable housing. In four years, my name never came up, and I moved to a different city. Upon arriving to Cambridge, I put my name on the list for affordable housing, and eight years later, my name came up. I had the chance to be in a lottery to have the opportunity to buy a home. Not a house for free, not even help with the down payment, just the opportunity to purchase an apartment for $300,000. A very expensive apartment, but in Cambridge terms, a very good deal. Now, mind you, this was not the little dream house I imagined. I didn't go get to go look at homes and see what kind I preferred. I had no choice at all except to say, yes, I'd like to buy this, or no, thank you, I would like to go back on the waiting list. So I wanted this little apartment with my whole heart. All I've ever wanted is for my son to have more opportunities than I did. I wanted to pass this on to him. And as it turns out, actually, according to the rules, he can never have a chance to own our place. When I die, we'll go back to the city. But at least the money will go to him. Even then, I still wanted it because I knew I would not have a chance to be a homeowner again. I'd already waited 21 years for that chance. I knew I'd lose a lot in the deal, but I did the math and I found it to be, over time, a sound financial decision and the opportunities matrix that faced me. So despite the sad thing I'm about to tell you, <laughs> in seven years I will break even, and this will all be a financial decision that will help my family in the long run. So back to the part where I win the lottery and I have a chance to buy an apartment and to access a mortgage that will accept a smaller down payment than normal. I still need 19,000 bucks for a down payment of closing costs. So remember that part about I have no savings because I barely made enough all those years to pay my bills? Because like billions of poor people, I had no access to capital, I had to find money in unusual places. I had been slowly building a life savings for my retirement. And by that time, I would had $44,000 saved toward my old age in a 401k. I took out $36,000 of that so that after taxes, I would have $19,000, which is what I needed in order to make this financial transaction happen. So to be clear, I lost almost half of my life savings in order to swing a down payment, in order to have a home, in order to keep my son in Cambridge, the place that he's lived since he was seven years old. Even though I moved all the time as a kid, I've been able to keep my son in just two school districts for his whole life, and I'm proud of this. This is the place where he's safe, where I'm safe, 
and the people are pretty nice. So, is any of my story okay? This is my son as a baby. This is us when we first moved to Cambridge. And this is us now. Do we deserve to live in Cambridge? Do we deserve to have a home? Why or why not? What about all the people that aren't here at this talk? I don't see many people from the public housing projects here. I don't see a ton of people of color here. Housing prices in Cambridge are skyrocketing with an average two bedroom apartment between $2,300 and $2,600 per month. One would have to make $40,000 a year before taxes just to pay the rent. No food, no car, no child care, just rent. Since 2010, prices have jumped and they just keep going up. This is officially a housing emergency. Now I'm here. I'm okay. I'm safe. Many of my friends in my community are not. I look around and I see diversity bleeding out of Cambridge. The diversity that I see staying is largely concentrated in housing projects. What does it mean if all of our diversity is disproportionately poor? 38% of the children at Cambridge Ridden Latin are public high school, qualified for free or reduced lunch. For a family like mine, a single mom and a kid, I couldn't earn more than $29,000 and qualify for free or reduced lunch. That means that 38% of the children at CRLS are living off of less than that. Could you live off of that? What choices and opportunities will those families have? Will they be able to purchase a home in the city where they were born, where they were raised and spent their formative years? What about the people like me who desperately depend on their network? Trusted friends to pick a kid up after school if your work meeting is running late, or to take care of a sick kid if you cannot take any more days off of work? If a poor family is pushed out of Cambridge, away from their network and into a new city, how will that help or harm the family? Our questions here tonight are how do we get here? It starts with pressure from the university buying up land and reducing housing stock available to the public. How did we get here? We see dramatic changes after rent control disappears. How did we get here? Structural, racial, and economic inequality across the world, the nation, and this city. What are the challenges? Deciding who we want to be as a city. Do we want only extremely wealthy people and extremely poor people? Do we want to lose our cultural diversity and the rich tapestry of difference? Do we think some people deserve to live here and some people don't? How do we come to that conclusion? Who is the we? Is the we anyone who lives in Cambridge now? Is it anyone who wants to live in Cambridge? Or is it anyone who at one point lived here? Where are the people who are experiencing homelessness? Do they deserve to live in Cambridge? Most young people experiencing homelessness are escaping violence at home. Your home has to be a pretty tough place if you think sleeping outside in the New England winter is better. How about those kids? Do they deserve to live in Cambridge? We have elders on our street. Do the elders deserve a home? Are they a part of the league? I'm ending with only questions because we're here tonight to explore, inquire, and open conversations. Who deserves housing? Is housing a human right? What does it mean if Cambridge prices push people of color and families out of the city? Thank you.
He said, no, 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 this is an area of, of Boston which has a very low homicide rate, but it has the highest burglary rate uh, in the state. And so I moved into 379 Marlboro Street back there. And this was coming from Detroit. And when Ken and I grew up in Detroit, Detroit was the richest city on the planet Earth. Well, I've been studying housing for at least the last 15 or 20 years, and I'm going to run through a little bit of history and uh, give you an idea of the kinds of things that I've been thinking about recently. Uh, we're about ready to put out the 15th edition of the Greater Boston Housing Report Card on November 29th. I hope you'll join me at the Boston Foundation for that. But one of the things that I've been thinking about since I've lived here in Cambridge for 30 years, and in answer, by the way, to Corinne's question, uh, I married into it. My wife uh, had a beautiful house in 1971 at 101 Trover Street. And so I married not only a lovely, lovely woman, but she has made me a very wealthy man. I'm also a landlord because we have tenants on our second and first floor. And uh, I have two surrogate grandchildren on the first floor. But I've thought a lot about what's happening, particularly in Cambridge and in parts of Boston. And the answer is we've been very successful since 1971. We're attracting population, as you'll see in a little bit. And many of those people who are coming here are young. They're our kids. They're graduate students. They're medical interns and residents. They're tech-savvy entrepreneurs and so forth. In fact, it's millennials that are putting the greatest pressure on our housing market, those 20 to 34 years old, mainly because of the expansion of higher education, uh, which was a pretty small industry way back when Cambridge was founded, and of course, one of the biggest industries in Massachusetts today. Uh, my son, who uh, went to school here but then to Northwestern University, is now teaching fifth and sixth grade in a Hispanic public school in Chicago and will not be on strike on Monday, uh, lives with three roommates, uh, and they are paying a combined total of $4,200 a month in rent in Chicago. But that's very typical here. Uh, when I first moved into Trofford Street 30 years ago, uh, about half the uh, homes on Trofford Street between Cambridge and Kirkland are triple debtors. And they were owned and lived in by local people. I knew it because at Christmas time, every one of those houses was beautifully decorated. There's one left that decorates their home, not only for Christmas, but for the socks, for the pets, <laughs> you know, for the Bruins and the Celtics. We also know from the study we did last year, where we did uh, research uh, based on proprietary information on over 115 multifamily uh, developments, uh, that the cost of producing new housing has gone through the roof. It's about $275 a square foot now, including land and soft costs and construction costs. That means um, if you want to build a small, let's say, equivalent of a triple decker today, a small one, 3,600 square feet, 1,200 square feet per floor, two bedrooms, one bath, let's say the home that Ted Williams, the great baseball player before David Ortiz, lived in at 37 uh, Foster Street in Alston, Brighton, uh, and paid $100 a month in rent when he got back from World War II. That house, which was built for $38,000 in 1918, would today cost $158,000 if we just took into account inflation. Today, that simple frame, 3,700 square foot home, would cost $1.1 million to build. And that's why it's so difficult, nay, maybe impossible, to build new housing for working families. We can build some housing for poor folks who qualify for subsidized housing. We do a fabulous job of building homes for millionaires. Uh, we've done a great job of building housing, luxury housing in the South Boston waterfront. I have a friend who lives in one of those huge buildings, which is totally leased out. And he loves it because he's a, he has a private concierge. He's about the only person living in that building. Most of those units are owned by Russians, Chinese, Norwegians. Uh, and I, I've been giving lectures and saying, well, this isn't really housing. I mean, it does have bedrooms and bathrooms and kitchens, but if nobody lives there, it's just staying homes. We need to build housing. So what I'm going to do is give you an idea of some new ideas about housing. But I wanted, since this is a historical society, Charlie's done some of it, is take you back uh, and look at some data. So let's look at the city of Boston, just across the river. Between 19, I'm sorry, 1870 and 1920, 50 years, the population of the city of Boston triples from a quarter of a million to three quarters of a million. 
right, in 50 years. And it was due to the wave of immigrants from Ireland and Italy and Eastern Europe. And what's fascinating is we housed every one of them, right? And the way we did it uh, for these people uh, during that period of time uh, was to build triple deckers. This is what happened to the Cambridge population. It's pretty much the same numbers that Charlie just showed you. Tremendous growth, uh, actually growing by more than four times between 1860, just before the Civil War, and 1920. Our population peaked in 1950 at about 120,000, and is still 10,000 lower than it was in 1950. So 60, uh, six years later, we actually have a smaller population than we had in 1950. And the solution, I said, was the classic triple decker. We built lots of those, and about 40% of the housing stock in Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville together are triple decker units or duplexes today, right? And that was the first demographic revolution, the immigrant revolution. The second demographic revolution occurred between 1950 and 1980, when many of, some of us in this room were the so-called baby boom children, right? And this is what happened to the city of Cambridge. The population plummets from 120,000 to 95,000 in just 30 years. So this, right? And what happened, of course, is that people came back from the war. They, unlike the first demographic revolution that came to the cities, came to the triple deckers after World War II with the GI Bill uh, and also with extremely discriminatory FHA financing. People fled the cities in the suburbs. Cambridge lost 21% of its population. Chelsea lost more than a third of its population. Boston lost 30% of its population. But what grew? Braintree, Lexington, Andover, Sharon, Burlington took all the records. You know where Burlington is? It grew by a factor of 10 from 2,400 to 24,000 people in just 30 years. That was the second revolution. And now we have the third demographic revolution. Young millennials and old people like me, right? So if we look at um, uh, the population of Cambridge from 1980 on, through this year, we'll see the population started growing again, about 110,000, still below 10,000, less than in 1950, right? Um, whoops. Uh, but what we see is a change dramatically in the population. So that in 2000, if we look at Boston, Cambridge, and Somerville together, kind of the inner core of Greater Boston, about one third of the population is between the ages of 20 and 34. But if you just look at the last decade where we have full census data, 74% of the growth in the population of our three cities are 20 to 34 year olds. That's the housing pressure. And you see it all the time. So here's the triple deckers in 1910 with the population who lives there. Here's the same triple deckers in 2016, and that's who's living there now. That's a problem, right? And what does it mean? The pressure on the triple decker market has been so great in duplexes, this is for all of Boston, it's actually faster rising than Cambridge. Since 2009, if you went out and purchased <coughs> a triple-decker unit, a single-decker unit, you would have seen the price double just since 2009. Oh. Double, right? And what does that mean? Rents have been going up through the roof. This is for inner greater city Boston. This is Boston, Somerville, Cambridge. Uh, we've seen a 59% increase in rents since 2009. If you're not rich, you can't afford this. It's not being poor. If you're a worker, a typical worker, you can't afford that kind of increase in rent. $3,000 times 12 is $36,000 a year just in rent. We know that between 2000 and 2013, that median rent for household income, not adjusted for inflation, not adjusted for inflation, that actually went down when we got that, went up 13, 13%, rents have gone up 21%, and asking rents, if you're a new tenant, have gone up 27% twice as fast as the typical income. What does that mean in terms of burdens? Back in 2000, about 39% of the population of all of Greater Boston, those are the five counties of Greater Boston, about 39% paid more than 30% of their gross income in rent. By 2011, more than half did. 
And if you want to look at the severely housing burden of families or households, 18% pay more than 50% of their income, more than half their income simply in rent in 2000. More than a quarter of all families in Greater Boston were doing it by 2011, right? So now let's ask the question, what does the future hold for Greater Boston's demography? Well, if you do projections out to 2030, which we have done at the DuPont Center of the Metcon Area Planning Council, you'll see that we're going to have a large population increase but overwhelmingly, it's going to be in two demographic groups. People like me, I'll be 72 in December, and 25 to 44 year olds. Millennials and seniors. That's where the growth is going to be in the population. Even today, over 75% of uh, households have no children in them. Some of them are young people with you know, three roommates. But 75% of all the housing units in Greater Boston have no children, okay, already. But as we move forward and we see millennials who are coupling up later, delaying child, child rearing, we're gonna see a huge increase in demand for housing, but it's mainly going to be for small units, not the four bedroom, three bath, two car garage that we're taking. So what we need are housing for young millennials, for working families, for aging bakery owners. And I've been trying to figure out what does that mean. And so I've been talking with a lot of people, including some of the university and college presidents. I've been talking with people at Mass Challenge uh, down on, on uh, Dry Dock Avenue. And we're talking about millennial villages. I don't know if that's the best name, but I'm thinking about something that's built for people like graduate students, medical interns, residents, young chefs, you name it. And building villages, and I'll tell you why I call them a village, which has a range of units from small micro units to, to you know, uh, studios and one bedrooms, common shared space with lounges, laundry facilities, seminar rooms, study rooms, music practice rooms, retail establishments on the first floor, roof garden for barbecues, near public transit, right? And we have a lot of architects now who are designing these kinds of units. This is Ed A. Now Stantec. Um, this is what these buildings would look like. They could be very nice. Uh, and what would the new collaborative entail, getting people together to build the housing that would be so attractive to young millennials and some seniors like me that we get out of the older housing stock and turn it back to the working families who need it. All those duplexes, not all of them, but many of those duplexes and triple deckers. We need private developers who would work together uh, particularly those who would take a reasonable, but not excessive investment return. We need to work with public quasi-publics like Mass Development, Mass Housing, MHP, Mass Housing Partnership, Mass Housing Investment Corporation. We need to get the universities and teaching hospitals, including my own, Northeastern University, to take master leases. Let's say we've got BU, BC, Northeastern, uh, Simmons, and a few other schools together, and they all work with the developer. They put up some of these villages, and then they agree to take a master lease, and they'll guarantee occupancy, market the hell out of them, to their graduate students in particular, and medical interns and residents. That makes the financing possible. We've got architects working on what the design might be. We're talking about building a manufacturing facility here for panelized or full units. Almost all of the panelized stuff that's coming in now is coming from either Canada or Pennsylvania. I've been talking with Mayor Walsh, about also doing training programs for young people to learn about <coughs> those jobs. This is the new Yuhu, the urban housing unit designed by Tamara Roy, uh, the new president of the Boston Society of Architects. 385 square feet, the prototype only costs $50,000. Put it in mass production, you get down to around $40,000 a unit. We've got to get the building trades on board uh, to encourage them to provide some relief on their normal uh, labor rates for this kind of housing. Uh, we need municipal government to do some reforms of zoning, reduce parking, possibly provide some land, and we need the state government. So that's the idea we have here. I come up with a nine-step program, which starts with getting the governor and our mayors together, learning how to build this new housing, and then sitting down with our universities, our teaching hospitals, other major employees and say, you've got to be part of the solution. Thank you very much.